Have a good day, everyone. I am Angel Artagin with my partner, Christina Lynn Arabit. We are here to report about Gordon Alford, The Psychology of Individual. Biography of Gordon Alford Gordon Will Lyde Alford was born on November 11, 1897 in Montezuma, Indiana. The four and youngest son of John E. Alford and Nelly Weiss Alford. Alford father had engaged in a number of business pintor before becoming a physician at about the time of garden birth. Lacking adequate office and clinical facilities, Dr. Alford turned the household into a miniature hospital. Both patients and nurses were found in the home, in the clean, sterile atmosphere prevalent. Cleanliness of action was extended to cleanliness of thought. In his autobiography, Alford in 1967 wrote that his early life was marked by flame Protestant preaching. Floyd Alford, his older brother, by seven years, who also became a famous psychologist, described their mother as a very fierce woman who placed heavy emphasis on religion. As a former school teacher, she taught young Gordon the virtues of clean language and proper conduct as well as the importance of searching for ultimate religion's answer. By the time Gordon was six years old, the family had moved three times, finally settled in Cleveland, Ohio. Young Alford developed an early interest in philosophical and religious question and had more facility for work than for games. He described himself as a social isolate who fashioned his own circle of activities. Although he graduated second in his high school class of 100, he did not consider himself an inspired scholar. In the fall of 1915, Alford entered Harvard following in the footsteps of his brother Floyd, who had graduated two years earlier and who, at the time, was graduate assistant in psychology. In his autobiography, Gordon Alford, in 1967, wrote, Almost overnight, my world was remained. My basic moral values, to be sure, had been fashioned at home. What was new was the horizon of intellect and culture I was now invited to explore. His, involved, his enrollment at Harvard also marked the beginning of a of a 50 years association with that university, which was only twice briefly interrupted when he received his bachelor degree in 1919 when a major in philosophy and economics. He was still uncertain about a future career. He had taken undergraduate courses in psychology and social ethics. In both disciplines, had made had made a lasting impression on him. When he received an opportunity to teach in Turkey, he saw it as a chance to find out whether he would enjoy teaching. He spent the academic year 1999 to 1920 in Europe, teaching English and sociology at Robert College in Istanbul. While in Turkey, Alpert was offered a fellowship for graduate study at Harvard. He also received an invitation from his brother Fayek to stay with him in Vietnam, where Fayek was working for the U.S. Trade Commission in Vietnam. Alpert had the meeting with Sigmund Freud that we briefly described in the introduction to this chapter. This meeting with Freud greatly influenced Alpert's later ideas on personality with a certain audacity, the 22 years old Alpert wrote to Freud announcing that he was in Vienna and offered the father of psychoanalysis an opportunity to, to meet with him. 
the encounter proved to be fortunate life altering event for all for Alfred not knowing that what to talk about the young visitor told Freud about seeing a small boy on the tram car earlier the day that day the young child complained to his mother about the filthy conditions of the car and announced that he did not want to sit near sit near passenger whom he deemed to be dirty Alfred claimed that he chose his particular incident to get Freud reaction to a dirt phobia in a child too young, so young. But he was caught bluffergasted when Freud fixed his kindly therapeutic eyes upon me and said, And was that little for you? Alfred said he felt guilty and quickly changed the topic. Alfred told his story many times, seldom changing any words and never revealing the rest of his lone encounter with Freud. However, Alan Elms has uncovered Alfred's writing description of what happened next after realizing that Freud was expecting a professional consolation. Alfred then talked about his dislike. Of co-presents. When Alfred returned to the U.S. state, he immediately enrolled in the Ph.D. program at Harvard. After finishing this degree, he spent the following two years in Europe, studying under the great German psychologist Max Wertheimer, Wolfgang Kohler, Willem Sturm, Hans Werner and others in Berlin and Hamburg. In 1924, he returned again to Harvard to teach, among other classes, a new course in the psychological of personality. In his autobiography, Alport 1967 suggested that his course was the first personality course offered in an American college. The course combined social ethics and pursuit of godness and morality with the scientific discipline of, of psychology. It also reflected Alfred's strong personality, dispositions of cleanliness and morality. Personality is a psychological and social aspect, which was a study derived from the research he had previously conducted with his brother. Two years after beginning his teaching career at Harvard, Alfred took a position at Dartmouth College. Four years later, he returned to Harvard and remained there for the rest of his professional career. Though his son returned to Harvard where he taught until his death in 1967, during his new teacher, at Harvard, Alfred sat on many committees and facilities groundbreaking courses. He acted as editor, faculty member, and fellow in, in 1939. He was chosen to be president of the American Psychological Association. During the next several years, Alfred was an active member of several societies and published several books in 1955. His fifth publication was released becoming VC Consideration for the Psychology of Personality. This book became one of his best-known works. In 1925, Alfred married, married Ada Lofkin Gold, whom he had met when both were graduate students, Ada Alfred, who received a master's degree in clinical psychology from Harvard had the clinical training that her husband lacked. She was a valuable contributor to some of Gordon's work, especially his so extensive case studies. The case of Jenny Goob got Masterson distinguished in the section tit titled Study of Individual. In the case of Marion Taylor, which was never published, wearing bomb 19... 97. The Alfords has one child, Robert, who became a pediatrician, and those son with Alford between two generations of physicians. A fact that seemed to have placed him 
in no small measure. Albert Award in Honors were many in 1939. He was elected president of the American Psychological Association in 1963. He received the Gold Medal Award of the American Psychological Association in 1964. He was guard awarded the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award of the American Psychological Association in, in 1966. He was honored as the first Richard Clark Hobart Professor of Social Ethics at Harvard on November on October 9, 1967, Alport, a heavy smoker, dead of lung cancer. Contribution to Psychology in Alford Unlike many other psychologists of his time, Alford placed a strong emphasis on conscious motivation and thoughts. In his leg to a strong interest, in the development of personality, although Albert is known as being influential in many areas of psychology, he is particularly well known for his trait theory. Albert also identified the extenses of what he termed genotype and phenotypes, internal and external con condition that motivates a person's behavior. He continued to develop the field of personality psychology while extreming the nature of a person's will, motivation, and determination. He distinguishes between drive and motive and explores the condition that support and effect age. Alport attempted to draw a clear distribution between motives and drive. For him, a drive is more akin to an unconscious behavior. For example, a woman might initially have a strong need to make friends because of early childhood abandonment or feelings of inadequacy, but an undefended motive can develop out of his drive, and the same woman might nurture her friendship because of her concern of her friends or because he enjoyed doing activities with them. Albert was uh, adamant that people are autonomous being, beings with their free will. They're not solely driving by insect and drives and not just governed by the fast. He emphasized the primacy of learning and argued that current behavior and thoughts are the product of an entire life history, including the present rather than just some brief period in early development. Quote by Gordon Alport, I love therapy. So many triangles in life are ultimate hopeless that we have to appropriate word other many language than language. Garden Alford So next is focus on the trait theory of Alford. Alford focus on the present moment instead of past history to better understand personality on individual and trait vary depending on situation. Next is Alport data collection procedure, considered electric approach, where it was personal document technique, which means examine person written and expo spoken words. So things like journal. Also, Alford focus on the study of values of self-report assessment tests and those categorize values into theoretical, economic, aesthetic, social, political, and religious. So next is structure of personality. To Alford, the most important structures are those that permit the description 
of the person in terms of individual characteristics. And he called these individual characteristics as personal dispositions. Personal dispositions. Throughout most of his career, Alfort was careful to distinguish between common trait and personal trait. Common traits are general characteristics held in common by many people. It can be inferred from factor analytic studies such as those conducted by Asenk and the authors of the five-factor theory. Or it can be revealed by various personality inventories. And common traits provide the means by which people within a given culture can be conferred to one another. Whereas, common traits are important for studies that make comparisons among people. Personal dispositions are of given greater importance because they permit researchers to study a single individual. So, Alford defined a personal disposition as a gener generalized neuropsychic structure peculiar to the individual with the capacity to render many stimuli functionally equivalent and to initiate and guide consistent equivalent forms of adaptive and stylis stylistic behavior. The most important distinction between a personal disposition and a common trait is indicated by the parenthetical phrase peculiar to the individual. Personal dispositions are individual, common traits are shared by several people. Personality Trait Theory or personal disposition. Trait approach. This approach makes use of the personality trait for identifying and describing the personality of an individual. Alford's trait approach. Gordon Alford was the first personality theorist who adapted trait approach in providing a theory of personality. According to Alford, personality traits are the basic units of the structure of our personality. So, to identify personal dispositions, Alford and Henry Oddbert counted nearly 18,000 or 17,953 to be exact. Personally descriptive words in the 1925 edition of Webster's New International Dictionary, about a fourth of which describe personality characteristics. From the list, they reduce the number of words to approximately 4,500 personality describing adjectives which they consider to describe observable and relatively permanent personality traits. Some of the terms usually referred to as traits describe relatively stable characteristics such as sociable or introverted. Others usually referred to as states describe temporary characteristics such as happy or angry. Others describe evaluative characteristics such as unpleasant or wonderful. And still others refer to physical characteristics such as tall or obese. So the question is, how many personal dispositions does one individual have? These questions cannot be answered without reference to the degree of dominance that each personal disposition has in the individual's life. 
if we count those personal dispositions that are central to a person, then each person probably has 10 or fewer. However, if all tendencies are included, then each person may have hundreds of personal dispositions or personality trait. So Alford determined that every human being possesses hundreds of traits that exist on one of three levels. So three level of traits are first is cardinal trait. These characteristics is a person's dominant trait and serves to a mold rather to mold a person's identity, emotions, and behaviors. So cardinal traits are traits which are so dominant that they can be used to define a person. One or two of these traits can be used to define enter personalities of people who have them. For example, is Mother Teresa is strongly associated with goodness and kindness, and Hitler can be associated with ruthlessness. And the second level is central trait. These are seen as four traits, although they are not dominant. They are inherent in most people and lay the foundation for our personalities and actions. So central traits are fundamental traits that form the basic foundations of personality. Not as dominant as cardinal traits, but every person contains 5 to 10 such traits and it varying mag magnitudes. The example of this is self-confidence, shyness, and honesty. And for the last level of traits or personal disposition is secondary traits. These traits are privately held and often only revealed in confidence or under certain condition or certain conditions or as i said a while ago they are often seen in certain situations only the example of this is the general fear a, a lot of people face while speaking in public or public speaking and it and it includes the selfish and greedy traits or personality traits is evaluation of trait theory or personal disposition despite its limitation as a useful theory Alport approach to personality is both stimulating and enlightening Anyone interested in building a theory of personality should first become familiar with Alford's writings. Few other psychologists have made as much effort to place personality theory in perspective. Few have been as careful in defining terms, in categorizing previous definitions, or in questioning what unit should be employed in personality theory. The work of Alport has set us a standard for clear thinking and precision that future theories will do well to emulate. So first is theory generated research. Alford theory deserve a moderate rating. Next is, Alford theory must receive a low rating in cost of ability. Next is, organization for observation. 
A useful theory provides an organization for observations. Does Alport's theory meet this criterion? But it is only for a narrow range of adult motives. Does the theory offer a meaningful organization for observation? Much is much of what is known about human personality cannot be easily integrated into Alport's theory. Specifically, behaviors motivated by unconscious forces as well as those that are stimulated by primary drives were not adequately explained by Alport. Next is, it serves as a guide for the practitioner. Alford theory has moderate usefulness. It certainly serves as a beacon to the teacher and the therapist, illuminating the view of personality that suggests that people should be treated as individuals. And last is, it is internally consistent and parsimonious. Concept of Humanity Alpert held an optimistic view of humanity, maintaining that people have at least limited freedom. Next, human beings are goal-oriented, proactive, and motivated by a variety, for, variety of force, most of which are within their realm and consciousness. Next, early childhood experiences are relatively minor importance and are significant only to the ex extent that they exist in the present. And last, both differences and similarities among people are important, but individual differences and uniqueness are far greater emphasis in Alfred's psychology.